dear Dean, dear chair of the research unit, dear colleagues, dear students, dear family and friends. In the year 2000, on the occasion of the dawn of the new millennium, the renowned church historian Roger Aubert, specialist in contemporary church history, made the following statement in a reflection on the future of the discipline. Il reste une part de vérité dont il veille à dache les idées mènent le monde, et les idées religieuses en particulier. L'histoire religieuse ne peut donc se désintéresser de l'histoire de la théologie. Toutefois, par le biais de l'histoire de mentalité, il importe de les aborder aujourd'hui dans une perspective renouvelée. How this history should look like specifically, he developed further in his article Les Nouvelles Frontières de l'Historiographie Ecclesiastique, The New Frontiers of Church History. In all this, however, he put one thing first, the warning to be wary of the appeal of new fashions and to remain true to the adage nova et fetra, new and old. Now, more than 20 years later, standing here talking about contemporary church history, I obviously feel somewhat intimidated by the warning raised by this great, almost mythical authority, not to follow new fashions too easily when developing new research on religious identities and ideas, but to always keep the middle ground between new and old. Appointed to develop the research line European Christianities and Identity Debates in the long 20th century, I was thrown right in the middle of the contemporary identity debates, as it were. Debates that are at full speed um, in present day society. Our own rector, Luc Sells, for example, even started uh, this academic year with an opening lecture in which he expressed his concern about the cancel culture and the unhealthy pressure for ideological conformity that emanates from the most extreme side of the woke movement. Although the characterization needs nuance, debates on identity are alive and well at the university. I myself, however, would have never thought that working on the history of Catholicism in the long 20th century would lead me to play a role in these debates. Even less was I convinced that my work on the history of the Second Vatican Council, the Ecumenical Council in the 1960s, in which uh, 2,500 Council Fathers redefined Catholicism, would even lead me to play a role in this woke and cancel culture debate. However, the complete opposite was made clear to me recently in the essay La Guerre du Feu by the French novelist and 2012 winner of the Prix du Monde Arabe, Boalem Sansal. In this essay, he states that Vatican II a répondu le wokeism et la cancel culture dans le monde occidental. Vatican II as the source of wokeism and cancel culture. Although I have my doubts about the accuracy of this historical interpretation, it is, however, where I want to start my lecture today. Indeed, I hope to show how appealing to the old and the new in contemporary church history leads to ways to deal with the central concepts and myths that play a role in the identity debates today. To develop this, I will follow a threefold structure. First of all, I will indicate how in the discipline of history of church and theology, religious identity is questioned in a new way. Next, I would like to point out the role that traveling concepts can play in studying these debates historically. And finally, I will make some methodological reflections to show how to bring together the old and the new. In my elaboration of all this, I will draw on my past research and on the lines of research that I'm currently pursuing. And I would like to say in advance uh, that this is often research carried out with colleagues and students, to whom I'm enormously grateful. And I will try my best uh, to also recognize their work during this lecture. In my examples, I will particularly focus on the long 1960s, described by Hugh McLeod as a period of political and religious reform in which also Vatican II played a pivotal role. What makes this spirit so fascinating for today's lecture is McLeod's emphasis that perhaps the biggest change was the weakening of the collective identities that had been so important in the years before 1960s. The transition from this collective to individual identity formation makes this a particular exciting period for the discipline of contemporary history of church and theology. 
a discipline of which Aubert stated that it had long held a certain preference for big figures and in institutional history. In these studies, identity is often referred to as a static and monolithic reality that is mostly externally defining the individual and collective identities in the sense of seeking conformity with what is usually considered orthodox. When Aubert noted this, the discipline was already in full swing, fundamentally determined by developments from those high profile 1960s onwards, developments that only re resonate more strongly today. I would like to discuss three in particular, summarized in the three keywords bottom-up, intersectionality, and hybridity. In a time period of 60 years, a lot has happened. New social history, together with the cultural turn, made the lived experience of ordinary people the focus of historical research, within which the history of the working class occupied a prominent place. In this way, not only the ideas and lives of renowned theologians, but also the thinking and spirituality of other often lesser known historical actors and groups are taken seriously. Also in country church history, working class religion and its theological intellectual underpinnings have become commonplace. It is in this domain that the field of country church history also seems to add value to the discipline of history at large. For as working class historian James Barrett made clear, clues to the intellectual and spiritual lives of common people might be embedded in religious rituals or prescriptive texts and in religious practice itself. Paying attention to these previously invisible figures and groups is, however, made difficult because of the scarcity of historical uh, sources. This makes the reconstruction of their religious conceptual frameworks all the more challenging. Moreover, contemporary ideological debates have made it clear how precarious the handling of these identities is. Critical race theory has, since the 1970s, strengthened even more the call to render justice to marginalized voices, also within history. It is the great achievement of law professor and since 2020 honorary doctor of our university, Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined the concept of intersectionality to point out how, on the one hand, identities are formed by the overlapping of different social categorizations. Next to social class, gender and race, Religion is also a determining factor herein. On the other hand, intersectional analysis has shown how some voices are discriminated even more than others on the basis of these overlapping categories. Intersectionality has both been taken up as an analytical tool in the field of history and religious history, as well as led to a greater awareness of how to deal critically with the historical study of individual and group identity. Thirdly, just as identities are formed by the overlap of different social categories, it is clear how an essentialist understanding of this religious identity can no longer be maintained. In her attempt to break through the classic monolithic religious categorizations, Meredith McGuire highlighted the ways with which individuals construct their own religious identities and the creativity they put in combining elements from different religious traditions and or discourses leading to what she calls religious hybridity. This concept not only challenges the study of religions in their present day forms, but as she points out, challenges historians of religion alike. A position fits in seamlessly with the call of historians of knowledge, such as Peter Burke, to take seriously the historical processes of religious eclecticism and blending. In the 1960s, for example, Western Catholics increasingly paid attention to Eastern spiritualities and their integration into their existing religious conceptual frameworks and practices. To study these religious expressions, religious hybridity presents itself as a very attractive concept for contemporary church historians. The research field is in full development and engages with these frameworks. In the past few years, a good number of inspiring works is appearing within the American academic context. Some notable examples um, uh, recently appeared are the anthropological study Live Loot in the Parish by Alicia Maldonado Estrada and Subversive Habits on the Role of Black Catholic Nuns in the US by Shannon D. Williams. In the West European context, many stories are still to be told where this bottom-up intersectional and religious hybridity framework can be inspiring. I'm very happy in that sense 
that my bachelor and master students are easily finding examples of these in the 20th century. Researching topics such as the Angulus prayer in rural areas in the early 20th century or the emergence of a Flemish Catholic homosexual movement in the 1970s not only bring to the surface and lead to a better understanding of identities that are not usually central to the narrative of contemporary church history, but they also lead to a deeper understanding of religious ideas and practices, as well as their interaction with social class or sexual orientation, respectively. Likewise, and building on these developments, is the project Christine Sunes and myself recently launched on the Auxiliaire de l'Apostolat, a Catholic lay women movement. I will use its development in the mid-20th century repeatedly as an illustration in today's lecture. Founded in 1917 by the Belgian Cardinal Mercier, who you see actually depicted here at your, uh, at your right, over there, um, these women took vows of obedience to the diocesan bishop to live a life in poverty and being discreet about their vocation. They, however, lived their Christian vocation to a professional life in society. In this way, they fully belonged to the laity, but were nevertheless unique in pursuing a very specific vocation. That their identity was not always well understood may be clear from a letter to La Vulop, one of the auxiliaries, sent to the Leuven theologian Gerard Phillips in 1961. In the letter, she made it clear to him that the auxiliaire de l'apostolat did not, under any circumstances, could be considered consecrated virgins, a self-definition ex negativo. She, however, remained silent on an alternative. The historical study of this self-definition of one's own and the group identity is precisely where all the previous developments converge. With only one publication, one academic publication uh, by Hizelis devoted to this group of women, the voices of the individual women belonging to the Auxiliaire de l'Apostolat not only seem to have disappeared in the writing of the history of Catholicism, but also fit in with the history from below. Given the genesis of this movement in the Catholic Sociale Hogeschool and indications that Joseph Cardin, the founder of the Young Christian Workers Movement, would support his most promising young women to join the Auxiliaire de l'Apostolat, their history offers a unique means for studying the social emancipation of working class women through Catholic frameworks. At the same time, they held a unique position in terms of gender. Their direct access to the bishop positioned them in a unique way to the Catholic Church's male hierarchy. At the same time, their vows of celibacy left all options open to fully participate in professional life and society, in a time in which this was absolutely not self-evident. The life of Maria Bars, as an expression of this vocation, is in this sense a very interesting case study. Belonging to the first generation of the Auxiliaire de l'Apostolat, her realization of this vocation interplayed with her role as president of the Flemish wing of the National Union of Christian Women's Guilds, the later KAV and present-day FEMA, and her role as senator, actually one of the first two female senators appointed in 1936. Unfortunately, the religious aspect in her life and identity, the history of the Auxiliaire de l'Apostolat in general, and other histories of forgotten figures and groups and their construction of religious conceptual frameworks and practices remain often untold. Time for us thus to tell their stories. When considering religious identities in the recent past, lessons can be learned from concepts such as bottom-up history, intersectionality, and religious hybridity. Yet, while they help to describe individual identities, the common aspect or identity remains more difficult to discern and thematize historically. I started with referring to Aubert's focus on the importance of the history of mentalities, in which he also refers to the relevance to study the ideas driving religious identities, groups, and movements. A theme I like to develop relating again to three keywords, intellectual sociability, traveling concepts, and myth-making. 
It must be said, first of all, that Aubert's appeal has in a way already become commonplace, be it explicitly or implicitly. In particular, the thematization in the French contemporary church history of intellectual sociability, the study of the history of intellectuals on the basis of their work as collectives bound together on the basis of structures and ideas, have helped to revalorize the historical study of different theological milieus and their interaction in the mid 20th century. With gratitude, by the way, I can refer again today to Philippe Chenault's comment that when it comes to this field, much progress could still be made because he even mentions the study of the Leuven theological milieu as a relevant field herein. It is in this field that I, secondly, am convinced that there is still progress to be made by focusing on the concepts constituting this intellectual sociability. These concepts can be understood in a limited way as specifically theological concepts, but equally as broader religious frameworks or expressions. In any case, what binds them is that they are flexible concepts that are dealt with in all creativity. Cultural theorist Mieke Ball refers here to traveling concepts, flexible concepts loaded with meaning, functioning within specific identity-related frameworks, creating intersubjectivity, concepts that are exchanged between disciplines and changing over history. As bearers of meaning, these concepts integrate a hybrid composition of ideas and are recuperated and renegotiated within pluralistic contexts. As such, Baal's idea of traveling concepts allows us to highlight the exchanges of these concepts between these aforementioned theological milieus but also in broader processes of intellectual exchange within 20th century Catholicism, in its interaction with other Christian denominations and non-Christians alike. Relevant for us in these processes is the constant redefining of a framework of traveling religious concepts, shared or not, in the light of one's own identity and normative tradition. In this process, the way these concepts constitute identities, becoming identity markers, and thus becoming the object of creative interpretation and or debate is of particular importance. It is these concepts, thirdly, where myth-making processes occur. As described by Erin Roberts, myths operate not only at the level of social formation, but also at the level of mental formation producing a set of ideological starting points that individuals may use as unifying points of identification. Myths are the narratives constructed and concepts used to create individual and common identities. The narratives and concepts that once questioned can easily lead to high profile debates. In this sense, debates at the Second Vatican Council were influenced by myth-making processes from previous years. But through the tendentious post conciliar reception, these debates were perhaps even more precursing the culture wars of the 1980s. To illustrate this conceptual framework, I like to refer to the concept of Christian humanism. This concept was central in my past research and was a widely popular concept in the course of the 20th century. After the concept of Christian humanism had emerged in the 1930s in the French Catholic milieu with the French philosopher Jacques Maritain and his book L'Humanisme Integral as its key architect, it soon traveled to other contexts. While in the pre-Second World War period, its meaning had often denoted a new counter-cultural Christianity, it received new meanings in the post-war period. In the Belgian context, the concept became popular in the socio-political field where it mostly offered the Flemish Christian community an understanding of its religious identity as in dialogue with society. In particular, the Flemish philosopher theologian Albert Tondaine inspired not only the students of the Universitas movement in Leuven, but much broader many persons in the Flemish civil society with his interpretation of the concept of Christian humanism, which was strongly defined by dialogue with culture. This was, for example, also true for the Auxiliaire de l'Apostolat, whom Don Dene accompanied as one of their spiritual directors, making it possible for the concept of Christian humanism to travel between completely different contexts, that is, between the academic and the professional world, 
to travel between an individual and common self-understanding, that is, when Don Dene preached his ideas to these women during their recollections, thus constituting their individual vocation and possible group identity, and between gender-defined understandings of the concept. That even a concept as Christian humanism can lead to intellectual sociability and myth-making becomes all the more clear when knowing that the first lay rector of our university, Piet de Sommer, who you see depicted here at your left, and later rectors like Roger Dillemans, whose scholarship program I'm a proud alumni of, would refer to elements of the same Christian humanism to define the interpretation of this university's Catholic identity. As such, they upheld the legacy of Don Dene, not only creating a common narrative and myth-making concerning the concept, but equally concerning the figure of Don Dene. That Bruce Lincoln was right that myths and rituals are often best understood as bloodless battlegrounds for social power may be seen from the role this concept of Christian humanism has, plays, has played and plays each time the identity of our university is debated. These traveling religious concepts, however, not only play a role at the local level, but easily surpass these in international and intercultural exchanges, where they come in contact with other intellectual milieus. The Second Vatican Council represents in Catholic history a special moment to study these processes, a council that has taken on a special role in Leuven's country church historiography. Thanks to the work of Jan Grotaars, Leo de Klerk, uh, Lieve Gevers, who you also can see here uh, on your right, um, and uh, Leo Kenis and Matthijs Lambrecht, um, in which the focus on the Leuven contribution to the Council was often central. I'm stepping into this tradition, and I too will happily point out the great contribution of the Leuven um, bishops and theologians, the so-called Squadra Belga that made this council, according to Yves Congar, in fact, even the first council of Leuven yet held in Rome. It is thanks to the enormous amount of work already done on their conciliar contribution and that of many other conciliar actors that research today can all the more focus on the role of intellectual milieus, the functioning and exchange of traveling concepts among them, and all this in a longer durée perspective whereby the pre-conciliar, conciliar, and post-conciliar periods are taken into account. Take, for example, the research of my doctoral student, Shidibere Nabugu, who is studying with a particular focus on the meaning of the concept of poverty, the pre-conciliar positions and intellectual coherence of the African bishops, the ways they apply this poverty concept to foster their agenda in the international and intercultural exchange happening at the Council and if, in the post-conciliar era, they either or not adapted their own understanding of the concept in interaction with the conciliar statements on social justice. In an exemplary manner, this project expresses the need to further illuminate the history of the Council, both in terms of um, underrepresented persons and groups, and, group, and uh, in terms of teams, also interculturally which the Vatican II Legacy and Mandate Project, in which my research group is involved, uh, prioritizes. For a second example, to highlight how the historical study of the Council through the lens of intellectual sociability, traveling religious concepts, and myth-making has enduring relevance, we can return to Don Dan's concept of Christian humanism. The common tradition of um, Christian humanism based on Maritain's thought, shared by several of the intellectual schools present at the Council, allowed Don Dene and others to integrate a positive understanding of humanism at large and the consequent dialogical attitude towards culture in the conciliar documents, more specifically in Gaudium et Spes chapter on culture. Don Dene made good use of a seemingly shared understanding of the same concept. The integration of these concepts in the final documents of the Council rendered them a particular authority. In a positive sense, this allowed for their further creative reception in local contexts. 
in the case of the Auxiliaire de l'Apostolat, for example, Don Dan himself would collaborate with these women, redefining their identities in the 1970s on the basis of the conciliar and social developments. Two developments to which these women themselves had contributed in the first place. In a negative sense, the use of traveling concepts at the Council allowed the differences between the pre-conciliar theological schools to re-emerge in all strength after the Council, such as in 1970, for example, when around 120 theologians came together in Brussels on the occasion of the 15th anniversary of the journal Concilium and the promotorship of the Belgian Cardinal Sunens, the assembled theologians, led by Antoine van den Boogaard, Yves Congaar, Hans Kuhn, Edward Schillebeeks, and Karel Rahner, prepared a common statement on the future of the Catholic Church and theology. At this conference, in line with the journal Concilium, they appealed to the Gaudium et Spes concept of culture, to advocate for a positive theological dialogue with their contexts. Their position was, however, clearly challenged by theologians not taking part in the conference, for example, Carlo Colombo and Hans Urs van Balthasar. That these last two were holding positions in the just-established International Theological Commission seemed to suggest an increasing division within the theological milieu in the 1960s, wherein, despite the differences, all claimed the same conciliar legacy. In sum, traveling concepts, with all their inherent meanings, creativity and flexibility, shape identities, provide this intellectual sociability and are at stake in myth-making processes and battle over their interpretation. In my lectures so far, I've mainly used Mieke Bal's idea of traveling concepts within a historical framework. Her theory on traveling concepts relates, though, in the first place to the exchange of concepts and theories between the different academic disciplines. The discipline of church um, and theology has always been in interaction with other disciplines from the humanities, the discipline of history primarily. In the discernment of this intellectual sociability and its interplay with traveling religious concepts, the Louvain tradition of archival and text-based historical research will obviously be further pursued. At the same time, and this brings us back to the new, this will be reinforced in two ways. Firstly, studying traveling religious concepts, we cannot limit ourselves to the study of textual material alone. As indicated before, the 1960s were characterized by an enormous creativity in the field of individual and collective um, meaning making, with new local theologies, new forms of expression and rituals. This whole process, moreover, interacted with the rise of popular culture. In Catholic historiography, for example, reference will quickly be made to the experimental liturgies in the 1960s. It should, however, not be forgotten that also the performance by my friend Peter Jan after this lecture fits within this framework. This too can be considered a long-term effect of the individualized processes of meaning making in the 1960s where existing traditions were cre creatively combined with new intellectual and religious frameworks. Precisely in this context, we cannot always appeal to textual material and or to ego documents preserved in archives. Scholars such as Alana Harris and Carmen Magnon have already shown how oral history, writing history on the basis of interviews, offers a solution here. This certainly is helpful in studying identities such as those of the Auxiliaire de l'Apostolat, where archival material is rare precisely because of their specific identity. Oral history can help to still put into words what was not written and appears to become lost for future generations. It is on this same principle, Annemie Dille, Vera Horens, myself, and Lene de Flem as doctoral student, will appeal to when studying the theological and ecclesial concepts used by bystanders in historical cases of transgressive behavior in Catholic contexts in the 1960s and 1970s. It moreover allows us to study the impact of these cases on the development of collective religious identities and societal understandings of Catholicism in the latter half of the 20th century. 
Secondly, studying traveling religious concepts and intellectual sociability, we cannot limit ourselves to the study of these milieus by referring to them as networks in the metaphorical sense. Appealing to network theory from the social sciences, further efforts will be made to push historical network research in the field of contemporary church history. It is one of these tools that the rise of digital humanities promotes and that we, that is to say, Linnick Timper, Roxanne Benz, and Michiel de Klerk and I, will further develop through our European research, or through our collaboration in the European Research Infrastructure for Religious Studies Resilience. The added value of applying historical network research in the history of church and theology lies particularly in the capacity to structurally map the networks of individuals and collectives to identify central actors and to pay particular attention to the so-called brokers, individuals that were able to exchange ideas between the different networks, between different theological milieus in our case. In light of the aforementioned tension over the reception of Gaudiumet's best concept of culture, historical network research allows us, for example, to easily map out theologians that were involved in the redaction of Gaudiumet's Spes, those who took part in the Brussels Concilium Conference, and those appointed to the International Theological Commission. Mapping and visualizing these networks structurally provide us with the perfect tools to better understand them, the figures that made exchange possible to map out theological fields of meaning and the role of traveling concepts herein, and subsequently to critically study existing narratives and perhaps myths that made it into history, such as the sharp dividing line between the conciliar legacy and the actors involved in the Concilium World Conference and the International Theological Commission. In conclusion, I happily return to the question raised at the beginning of this lecture. Is there a future for contemporary church history? And express my hope that I convinced you there indeed is a future. That is to say, when we creatively combine the old and the new. For it offers us the means to complete a rich tradition of contemporary history of church and theology with bottom-up histories in which religion is considered a defining aspect in the creative construction of identities. It offers us the means to historically reassess how traveling religious concepts moved between different intellectual milieus and were completed with meaning-enabling identity and group formation. It offers us the means to build further on the strong basis of archival and text-based research and integrate new methodologies to structurally capture the complexities of traveling religious concepts in history. Holding all these aspects together in a fruitful interaction, I hope to have done justice to Roger Aubert's hopes for the future of the discipline when he pointed out la nécessité d'éviter les exclusives. Le nouveau ne doit pas substituer à l'ancien, mais le compléter. It is on the basis of this interaction between the new and old that contemporary church historians will be capable of shedding light on the processes of meaning making of individuals and groups and the role of religion herein, and be critical of instances where myth making takes over from writing history. However, this critical role is anything but new. It is probably only the context and concepts that have changed and are nowadays much more raised through concepts such as woke and cancel culture. I hope to have demonstrated sufficiently that this can only be done in exchange with others. Because that is also what I have learned the past years, that the most important insights always come in contact with others. And it is only right to recognize so. It is as my son class said two weeks ago, people are much more important than toys because toys can be bought back when they break down. But this is not the case with people. I'm therefore very grateful to all of you, my important people, students, colleagues, friends, my family, for it is you who inspire my research in the first place and put it back on track when it breaks down. I trust that you will continue to play this inspiring role um, when I want to make my contribution to the, dare I say, Christian humanist project of this faculty and university in the years to come. Thank you very much. <laughs>